You can keep a great leader away from his people. You can imprison him. You can torture him. But you cannot break him. You cannot halt the inexorable march of the future. You cannot deny history. Running virtually parallel to the history of the non-aligned movement is the story of a man who made history himself. Nelson Mandela, a man who led his people in an epic struggle against injustice, oppression and racialism with indomitable courage and fortitude. Imprisoned in 1962 for 27 long years and released on February 11, 1990. The spirit of Nam is captured in the images of this living legend who now takes over the leadership of the non-aligned movement. enslave a nation if the spirit will not be enslaved. That was the Bandung spirit, and that is the Nam spirit. The Berlin Wall comes down. Some call it the end of ideology. Others proclaim it as the end of history. But even though the drums of the Cold War retreat, new hegemonies emerge to threaten the world. And the West continues to use international institutions, military power, and economic resources to run the world in ways that will maintain Western dominance, protect Western economic interests, and promote Western political economic values. For NAM, the United Nations became a focal point of its activities. NAM's strivings for decolonization, peace and disarmament, and development became part of a shared vision. NAM strove to strengthen the UN and make it more democratic. NAM resisted efforts from within the movement to create alternative structures at the expense of the UN. The UN headquarters continue to serve as the most important meeting point of NAM. Ministerial meetings take place in New York at the beginning of the regular sessions of the UN General Assembly. Regular meetings of the NAM Coordinating Bureau are also held at the UN headquarters. The Bureau coordinates NAM's activities within the UN. Your active participation in the reform process will guarantee that the United Nations remain a genuinely representative and effective world body. I'm afraid there will be reforms, but those reforms will not benefit the developing countries. The Secretary General of the United Nations, which is the Security Council, which is uh, very, very undemocratic uh, because you have the concept of permanent membership. Now, there is nothing permanent in a democracy or in a democratic setting. After all, the UN was not established for democracy. It was established to avoid a world war. At the beginning, it had nothing to do with democracy. And that's why there were five permanent members of the United Nations. Uh, uh, is, is that democracy? Of course not. Uh, but uh, then the question of peace or war is not determined by uh, uh, by democratic means, yeah, it's determined by uh, by the big powers who have who who are in a position to uh, either to uh, to start a global war or, 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 or to create peace. What type of security council we are perceiving? I've been demanding both in the UN and elsewhere. Please define the criteria first. Who are entitled to get into the security council? In my country, we have one billion people. They have no place there. We Indians are reputed to have a third eye, and I have it. And whenever I go to a UN building, and I pass by the chamber of the Security Council, I, my third eye reads a signboard there. You can come in only if you have money or the bomb. Money is difficult to make. You are forcing people to make bombs. The difficulty. How do you comment? It's going to be very important that the non-aligned movement arrives at common consensus around this issue. Um, I think, unfortunately, in the past, 
what the NAM has shown is that there have been a great number of differences between uh, member, uh, members within the, within the non-aligned movement. Uh, but uh, uh, the way the process of the reform of the Security Council is going on uh, does not seem to be, again, very much uh, in the favor of the non-aligned movement because the major uh, uh, powers are very keen to bring in a few selected countries as permanent members, uh, particularly Japan and Germany, and uh, uh, let uh, the developing countries quarrel among themselves for years to come as to who among them will be represented. Indeed, the United Nations has to reassess its role, redefine its profile, and reshape its structures. It should truly reflect the diversity of our universe and ensure equity among the nations in the exercise of power within the system of international relations in general and the Security Council in particular. Reform is increasingly assuming the form of downsizing and weakening the United Nations in the name of uh, bringing about managerial efficiency uh, in the name of uh, saving resources. What is really happening is that uh, those uh, activities of the UN which are directly conducive to serving the interest of the developing country and bridging the gap between developed and developing countries are being wound up. Uh, previously, for instance, there used to be a United Nations Center for Transnational Corporations. This has been effectively dissolved and integrated under UNCTAD. NAM has been urging the UN to focus decisively in favor of development so that it remains central to its mission. As the United Nations matures into the new millennium, it is called upon to facilitate the birth of a new world order of peace, democracy, and prosperity for all. The time to act is now. I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. These words from the Bhagavad Gita came to the mind of Robert Oppenheimer, leader of the Manhattan Project, as he witnessed the first man-made nuclear explosion at Alamogordo, New Mexico, on 16 July 1945. Within the next few months, death came indeed to some 200,000 inhabitants of the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The world has not been the same since. For NAM, disarmament has always been central to its agenda. The non-aligned movement has persistently advocated the elimination of nuclear arms. It has resisted the possession of nuclear weapons by a group of a few privileged nations designed to perpetuate the status quo in the global power structure. under a kind of regime of terror. Terror of what? Terror of some kind of catastrophe, like war descending upon us. Some kind of disaster when nuclear weapons are used. And the future of the world, of the world's survival is in peril. I am no man of wisdom. I am only a person who has dabbled in public affairs for nearly half a century learned something from them, and mostly that I have learned is how wise men often behave in a very foolish manner. The issues of war and peace, survival or annihilation of humanity, the glories of its civilization, and the right to live were too important to be left to a handful of nations. Development, independence, disarmament, and peace are closely related. Can there be peace alongside nuclear weapons? Without peace, my father said, all our dreams of development turn to ashes. It has been pointed out that global military expenditure is 20 times the total official development assistance. Each day, each hour, the size and lethality of nuclear weapons increase. A nuclear aircraft carrier costs $4 billion, which is more than the GNP of 53 countries. The hood of the cobra is spread. Humankind watches in frozen fear, hoping against hope that it will not strike. 
Never before has our Earth faced so much death and danger. The destructive power contained in nuclear stockpiles can kill human life, indeed all life, many times over, and might well prevent its reappearance for ages to come. Our movement has worked continuously for nuclear disarmament through dialogue. Last year, six nations met in New Delhi and took an initiative for disarmament and peace. This initiative, which was endorsed by our coordinating bureau, reflects the will of our movement. The hope of a disarmament dividend generated by the end of the Cold War has turned into a mirage. The nuclear club still justifies nuclear arsenals and policies of nuclear deterrence. The nuclear powers still lack the political will to accept the overwhelming wish of the international community. What Nam had been preaching for the last 35 years is now being propagated by many in the rich countries. Public opinion is crystallizing in these nations in favor of disarmament. Uh, in the eyes of some members, that the non-aligned movement, uh, by not agreeing with the NPT, has in fact uh, made a negative contribution because the NPT could have brought stability to a number of, uh, of areas around the world. I think it's important that the non-aligned movement takes up perhaps the position uh, taken by, for example, Africa on the development of a nuclear-free zone in Africa. Yeah, we want to create a nuclear-free zone, but we are not in a position to stop uh, ships carrying nuclear weapons from passing through our region. So uh, until there is a commitment on the part of the nuclear powers to stop uh, use, uh, deploying their nuclear weapons, uh, demanding for a nuclear-free zone uh, actually is fairly meaningless. I think one of the things that uh, was dramatized by the recent nuclear weapon tests uh, by India and Pakistan was that uh, you cannot uh, uh, attain the goal of non-proliferation uh, through a discriminatory route and through the route, uh, uh, you know, where uh, a few countries can retain their nuclear weapons and the rest of the world is denied to possess such weapons. And when he conducted the test, then suddenly everybody has woken up and feel that there is such a threat. From that point of view, it gave a very salutary shock to the complacency of the great powers and the world opinion which was molded by them. And uh, uh, I believe that uh, we exploded the bomb not with the intention of uh, using, using them. India's recent nuclear test took place in a geopolitical environment where our security was becoming even more threatened by the overt and covert nuclearization of our neighborhood. We do not, however, believe now any more than we ever did before that nuclear weapons are here to stay. On the contrary, if the established nuclear weapon states agree to negotiations to abolish nuclear weapons, we will be the first to join. Today, I urge them, as India has urged them so many times before, to join us in the non-aligned movement in negotiating a nuclear weapons convention through which we can eliminate this last category of weapons of mass destruction. In the face of structural global economic constraints, even the most strenuous efforts by many developing countries to capitalize on opportunities have floundered. The process of globalization has put severe strain on the development prospects of the South economies. Poverty has continued to increase causing immense human suffering in developing countries. Definition almost, the NAM countries are not the strongest countries in the world. So it means that uh, the NAM countries are losing 
whatever little grip they had on the um, on the economy, international economy. Still, I think if we stand together, we can exert some influence to protect our interests. But uh, as you know, uh, the pressures applied by the strong countries on some of the um, small countries which have, uh, which owe them some obligation, make it difficult for them to cooperate with others who want to have a more independent stand. Trading opportunities of developing countries have been neutralized by the use of protectionist measures. The sharp decline in the availability of concessional finance for development is alarming. Aid from developed countries as a proportion of their GNP has fallen to the lowest recorded levels. Though the population of the US and Europe is only 20% of the total world population, it consumes over 80% of world resources. All development is US Eurocentric and provides just one solution to the problem of all nations, no matter how disparate. The world's production and trade is being increasingly centralized in the hands of a few hundred transnational corporations. They are so strong, some of them at least, that they can develop or try to develop a strategy of their, of their own, irrespective of the overall interest of capital in their uh, origin, nation of origin. And they can come and be uh, relatively independent from the governments. That is at the root of the anti-state ideology which is developed currently. It is a strategy which uh, is the strategy of the transnational. Of course, it is hypocrite to a certain extent because they do need uh, the, uh, their own state in some cases. The gap between the developed and the developing world continues to widen. At present, the average per capita income in industrialized states is 58 times higher than in the least developed countries. The present crisis is related to the earlier global debt crisis during the 80s. It is now called the currency meltdown, and it is affecting primarily the Southeast Asian countries, the so-called tiger economies. And it serves as a wake-up call, as a lesson, as a warning to the countries of the South who want to follow the miracle that this kind of development strategy, which is based on massive finance, capital, which just as quickly flies out of your country at the smallest hint of trouble. One thing colonialism did for us in my country and most parts of Africa was to produce us into African Westerners. And therefore, we have tastes and choices that we cannot meet. Our local resources, we don't have the base to meet those choices and to meet those tastes. If the elites of Asia and Africa, if they changed and they turned the reference model around, instead of using the overseas Europeans as their reference model, if they turned that around and they used instead their own poor as their reference model, then we would be achieving an affordable standard of living and we would also be able to cope and eradicate our poverty. Then this globalization is an antagonistic civilization process because you confront white against black, north against south, men against women, consumerism against happiness and stability. The reining in of finance capital is something which I think there may be a growing broad consensus on. The anarchy which prevails now in the financial system threatens the, whole, the future of the world capitalist system. This is something, for instance, which unites people like Prime Minister Mahathir on one hand and uh, international financier George Soros on the other, uh, both of whom actually uh, are very critical of the anarchy which has been introduced by the dominance of finance capital at this stage in world history. Uh, in a vast country with millions of people, 
and uh, poverty uh, um, rampant, uh, we cannot liberalize recklessly uh, in such a way that the balance of society is upset. And uh, while uh, some sections would flourish, make profits, uh, the rest of the people would be left without employment and helpless. Therefore, we had a we we have to have a balanced approach. The full potential of South-South cooperation is yet to be realized. It can be promoted through the sharing of development experience, transfer of technology, and exploiting the latent synergies and complementarities between the NAM countries. The idea of, uh, or the principle of South-South cooperation, it uh, has been underlined for so many years, for so many decades. Uh, but it was not applied. Now we feel not only that we need to apply it, but we are in a position to apply it. With many of us uh, that have good economies or emerging economies, uh, stable uh, uh, growth and so on, we are in a position to apply that. The realm of science and technology could well be the key to South-South cooperation, as well as to the development of the South. It is not often realized that the real difference between the North and the South hinged on the application of science and technology. While the North applied these consistently over a long period and on a large scale, the South was denied the benefits of science and technology during the last two centuries or so. Within the South itself, there are a number of countries who have developed in the field of science and technology. Some are in fact poised at the cutting edge of technology. They can share their knowledge and interact with others in a very significant way. This kind of South-South cooperation can help overcome the problems of transfer of technology and the pressures from developed countries. The South's coming of age in many fields gives it a new role in shaping the world. Ownership and use of resources will determine how developing countries meet the challenges of new international economic developments in the 21st century. Many NAM countries are moving towards acquiring strength in capital, technological and human resources. However, the classical divide between natural resources, that is commodities, minerals and metals, ecological resources, that is rain forests, biodiversity and manpower resources owned by the South, and the technological, capital and knowledge resources owned by the developed countries remains. What is the North's position? What is ours is ours. What is yours is also ours. This dichotomy in the North's position has to be actively addressed because in the name of global integration, the dilution of sovereignty has been asymmetrical. The capacity of developing countries to use their resources in the best interests of their own peoples has been eroded. The South nations have now to make concerted efforts to strengthen preferential trade among themselves to tackle the problems posed by the developed countries. As owners of an overwhelming part of the world's biodiversity and resources, the developing countries can take the initiative to take control, regulate the use, and reap maximum benefits by the application of biotechnology. We have signed the World Trade Organization Agreement Treaty, and, uh, uh, but still we have to uh, safeguard ourselves because um, uh, many of the developed countries are, uh, though they have signed the same WTO, but they are not practicing it. Anti-dumping and uh, uh, measures they are adopting very liberally. Yeah. So uh, we have to be careful, we have to argue within the WTO system, our case. The rules of the game that continue to perpetuate unfairness, inequity, should be resisted. And the NAM has to play a very significant role in this. To try to put together some kind of a consortium to ensure that trade issues are looked at very, very closely and try to set up building blocks for what ultimately will become a South-South trade organization, which can do business as a block with what will remain of the World Trade Organization. Um, experience has shown that the northern countries are very worried at dealing with the South as a bloc, because they know uh, that um, 
Uh, when the South uh, negotiates as a block, it is a very powerful block. So they would rather have a situation in which they deal with the South and countries at an individual level and virtually, virtually break them. I think the, the, the non-aligned movement itself could be restructured into a South-South organization that deals with South-South issues in order to formulate a constructive uh, South-South position as far as negotiations with the Northern Industrialized Nations are concerned. Now in the post-Cold War era, whether we like it or not, the private sector is now being seen as, as a major way forward in terms of economic development. And perhaps the non-aligned movement can shift its emphasis into, into saying how can we foster these private sector cooperative uh, initiatives and so on. How structural adjustment programs are disadvantaging women, not only in Africa, in Asia, even in Latin America. And uh, I would think that this is certainly one issue, one important pertinent issue that NAM or South-South organizations involved in COP can take up and, 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 and address. At the moment, what I see is a lot of groups from the North linking up with women in the South. And as a result, we find that some of the issues that we as women in a developing country are, are taking up are issues that I think will be priority in a developed country and not in a third world situation. I believe that um, one of the areas where we have not been very strong in South-South cooperation is to really make the gender issue topical. Hegemony in the world now, after the end of the Cold War, is not perpetrated through the force of arms. It is perpetrated through a, a stringent control of information and information technology. I think this is one of the challenges for the NAM in the future, how to develop their own news agency. If you master the information, and then you master the world. Uh, I think a lot of things must, uh, must happen now in order to, uh, to reduce uh, the cemetery move into an area where NAM can be a bit more action-oriented. Let us join hands to ensure that as we enter the new millennium, the political rights that the 20th century has recognized and the independence that nations have gained shall be translated into peace, prosperity, and equity for all.